Paul is the VP of, of uh, Hydrogen at Shell, and he's going to tell us uh, about the latest insights around what's happening around the world around hydrogen. There's a lot happening, and things are moving quite fast. So um, great to have you, Paul. I'm going to start with demand. <clears throat> we all know that we have to activate demand uh, and ensure that supply and demand collaborate uh, together. Um, you have a lot of conversations with the demand centers. Great to hear. What are, what's the latest that is happening in this space? Yes, it is all about connecting that demand to the, you know, the emerging hydrogen um, kind of supply system. Um, and in Shell, we believe in the powering progress strategy that it is important to start from the customer backwards. So understanding what that demand looks like, the customer's willingness to pay, but also their switching cost. And I would say there's roughly three sectors that we're most excited about from all the conversations that myself and my team are, are having at the moment. One is the obvious one, right? It's the current use of hydrogen as a feedstock and backing it out as much of the gray hydrogen that you produce today. So you're looking at petrochemicals, fertilizer in, in particular, as those two sectors where hydrogen is feedstock. And to just give you an idea of the size of the challenge, that's, that's 94, 95 million tons of hydrogen already, of which less than, we heard it from Bart, less than 1% of that is, is clean hydrogen. Yeah. So that's a pretty sizable chunk to start with. The second sector on, on heavy uh, industry uh, that almost took us by surprise is steel making. So when we started this journey around sector by sector, understanding that yes, the energy transition will play out in a different way, at a different pace in different parts, but sectors will have things in common. Um, you know, a steel mill has many different decarbonization options. Could look at CCS, could look at um, biomass to replace the coal, or could look at hydrogen. And I think there we see almost a consensus that direct reduction of iron using hydrogen is, is the preferred pathway for, um, for decarbonization. So steel is probably the next big sector. And then the heavy road transport. Uh, we, you know, all those sectors that are hard to electrify directly. Uh, I was really pleased that um, you know, we heard a bit more news around uh, AFIR, so the, the European kind of network that also includes every 200 kilometers a hydrogen station. So we believe there will be a mix there of electrification of demand and, uh, and hydrogen. But those three sectors, and especially the combination of these three that we'll get to when we talk about hubs, is what really excites us. Yeah. And within these three sectors, we, we, we all hear about the need for new business models, new ways innovative ways of either creating products or going to your mar to the market. A any thoughts? Have you seen new business models that you like or are you working on some exciting uh, ideas? Yeah, I think um, business model innovation is almost as important or equally important as uh, the technology that sits behind all of this. And I'm going to take an example that we found in the sustainable aviation fuel sector um, initiative called Avelia, because our insight was that you know, it was very hard to aggregate the demand. A lot of airlines were asking for, for um, sustainable aviation fuel, but couldn't really look at uh, an end-to-end -end business model. And then we recognized that their customers, so the flying public, and especially people who travel on business travel, were really the ultimate end customers that could drive voluntary demand ahead of mandates coming into play. Uh, so Avidia creates that platform. Um, it allows aggregation of that demand and really pulls through um, the need and, the, and the, the impulse for building more SAV, um, you know, for those, for those customers. And, you know, in the two sectors I just mentioned, in steel and in heavy goods transport, you can look at similar business models. So you could think about green steel being driven by the need for the automotive industry and consumers willing to pay a little bit more uh, for their vehicle being lower carbon in the production of the, uh, of the, the vehicle itself. So, that, you know, that you spread that green steel premium, if you like, uh, within the value chain. So you're going B to B to C almost in that sense. Um, and the same is true for uh, activating the demand for hydrogen trucks, where, you know, I would sit in a conversation with DHL and DHL would say, that's great that you've got a hydrogen truck, but we actually contract our shippers and the shippers are actually doing that on behalf of uh, companies that are distributing, you know, a famous beer brand. And you need to talk to those guys because they might well be willing to pay a premium for the decarbonization of that chain. Yeah. And these new business models need to be built and explored, and especially for the early adopters. That's how we can unlock the early value chains. Yeah. And I think also one of the models that you, I think you're working on is the idea of trucking as a service as well, how you can help the sector, right? You, you own the truck, you lend it out, and this is 
to help essentially the sector because the TCO of a hydrogen truck is, is essentially more expensive, right? Exactly. So I think in the initial um, phases, it's all about taking on risk in, in different uh, pieces and making it easy for the customer to switch uh, ahead of you know, all the incentives falling into, uh, into place. Yeah. Well, you, you spoke about natural demand or you know, green premiums. Regulation is also important and, and policies. Um, I'm sure you also have a lot of discussions around policy. Um, what do you see being something exciting happening in the space and what are your predictions? Yeah, and I think regulation almost is a customer in its own in its own right. Um, so, so maybe it's a B to G to B to whatever it is. You know, can think of all kinds of the alphabet. Yeah. Um, when I came into this job, um, 2019, there was only one country that had a stated hydrogen policy, which was Japan, yeah. and they had a series of incentives. And METI was really weighing in. Now we have you know over 50 countries that have a stated policy. We have regional policies. Um, and there's almost an arms race now going on uh, with the American incentives being put in play. What does that mean for Europe? How does it play into industrial strategy? But I think there are kind of three things that policy has to get right. It's the balance between carrot or stick. So actually understanding where do you push and where do you provide incentives. And make sure that those incentives don't only cover capital cost because there's a lot more risk that needs to be covered. Um, it's the balance between supply and demand incentives. So yes, you can have an approach where you're just stimulating so much hydrogen coming to the market that all the use cases will fall into play, um, but it's unlikely because there's so much switching cost at the other end. Yeah. So the balance supply and demand is important. And I think then certainty, you need policies that survive at least three consecutive governments. You need at least a 10 year period where this all makes sense. So if you got the carrot stick, the supply demand and the longevity right. Um, and it also supports not just individual projects, but the infrastructure that uh, that needs to happen. Then I think you have a coherent set of, of policies that can really unlock the value chain. If one of these things is missing, it's very hard for any project to be investable. Maybe also related to, to the, the policy side, we, we keep hearing still about the colors of hydrogen, right? And essentially the pathways of hydrogen, we hear the blue, the green, but there is now a discussion around, should we focus more on carbon intensity? And, and we even hear that IEA might issue a report on that very soon. What are your thoughts on that? How will the pathways look like in the next years? Yeah, and I think uh, it's so funny. My, uh, my daughter overheard me on, on one of these talks and I was talking about green and blue and pink and all that. I said, Dad, what are you doing? Are you building rainbows? I thought you were doing hydrogen, right? And I think so. it's great to have it simple labels, but everybody in this room knows that it's about carbon intensity oh. and having clear outlined rules that don't just work in one geography, but also if we think about the international trade of hydrogen long term, it needs to work. It needs to be simple. Mm. It needs to be unchallengeable, if you like. Uh, but it also needs to be implementable, um, uh, if you like. And there are good examples out there. I think it, it's, um, we're not that far off from actually setting individual levels, uh, but we have to stop the debate around uh, the taxonomy or the, the color coding of the hydrogen because it's really holding back individual investments because you don't know whether you're going to meet the threshold or you don't know whether your project will be eligible to kind of be pulled into uh, places like Europe where there's incentives in play. One school of thought is that because the incentives in, in the US are so phenomenal, yeah. um, that that by default will start to set the global standard for where the different thresholds will, will sit. Um, and there's, there's some consensus around that view forming. Okay. Well, uh, time is running out, but I have to talk about Hydrogen Holland One because it's a great success. One of the very few projects around the world to pass the FID, one of the largest green hydrogen projects. What are the main learnings from this project? How, how did you make it happen? The, the, the main learnings uh, are that uh, although it's um, a relatively modest uh, capital investment, it attracts more attention from our executive committee and the board than any other project <laughs> that they... So if you wanted to get exposure and uh, meet senior uh, people in your company, uh, doing a hydrogen project is a really good way of, uh, of doing that. <laughs> don't, don't expect all of the, the reviews to be favorable. But all joking aside, I think it is a foundational project. I think we learned probably three things from it, is that if you want to get a project like that uh, approved, it does help to be de-risked on both sides of the project. So because we had our own wind farm asset, that we could secure the 
super duper compliant additional um, you know green electrons to go into the asset. Yeah. It also helps to be you know integrated on the energy and chemical part on the other side with a very flexible asset in our Rotterdam um, you know petrochemical complex, which is self sufficient in hydrogen today, but it could also easily absorb the 200 megawatts. So. First learning is it helps to be integrated, right? and that's, that's an important play. The second piece is that um, it's also good sometimes to be bold. So one of the, um, you know, because the enabling infrastructure will not happen if there's only one project. And we have to be modest here and saying, you know, Holland Hydrogen 1, we took FID also to send a signal of confidence to the market so that other projects could materialize. So on that same conversion part on the mass fluxer, you know, we're looking forward to get some neighbors for, for, for HH1. So it's, it's good to be integrated, but it's also good not to be, uh, not to be alone in, uh, in that space. Um, and the third bit is actually that create, creating the future value for it and proving the business model is equally important as actually the technical maturation of the project. So we'll have all kinds of challenges in building the assets, making sure the technology works, making sure that everything is done safely um, but at the end of the day, it's also about understanding how this asset in the future will make money uh, and, and how the uh, the end-to-end -end value chain actually allows uh, not just the decarbonization of the asset, but also looking at, um, you know, the, the future business models that it underpins. Okay. All right. I think we have a minute left. Maybe let's pick a question. <clears throat> uh, what hydrogen carrier technology are you focusing on? This is a very big question, of course. Yeah, so when I, um, when I came into the role, um, I, I was very pleased that we had already started a very bold move in terms of liquid hydrogen shipping um, you know, between Australia and Japan in a consortium with uh, Japanese partners and you know, um, uh, very much sponsored and encouraged by the Japanese government. So liquefaction of hydrogen is still one of the key carriers that we, we look at. Um, we also now understand a lot more about the challenges of doing that. We're certainly not dismissing ammonia or other intermediates. Uh, and in fact, we're looking at a project in Oman today that, um, you know, together with Alicia, um, that, um, you know, would look at ammonia as one of the, one of the energy vectors. Every time we do a calculation, um, the end-to-end -end kind of cost and the round-trip efficiency roughly comes out the same which means for me as an engineer, that means more work needs to be done before you can actually make a decision. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, we're out of time and just really wanted to thank you, Paul. This went really fast, but thank you very much. And it's great to see the, how much you're progressing and hopefully this gives confidence as well that you know, we can't pass FID and we can't have projects into the future. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, right. Derek.